afternoon. Uh, it gives me great privilege and pleasure to introduce Professor Lee, who has just joined us from the University of Michigan. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary scholar working at the intersection of landscape design and climate change adaptation. Her research tackles the challenge of creating landscape change that makes communities more resilient, but is also welcomed by communities. Currently, uh, Professor Lee is interested in understanding the everyday landscape experiences and community perception of novel nature-based solutions, which she'll be talking to us today about. She holds a PhD and a Master of Landscape Architecture from the University of Michigan's uh, School of uh, Environment and Sustainability, excuse me, and a Bachelor's of Engineering and Landscape Architecture from Tongji University in Shanghai, China. Before turning her primary focus to research, she practiced in design firms, including Smith Group and AECOM. When I was asked to introduce Professor Lee, I reached out to her advisor, who, uh, for those of you that don't know, Professor Joan Narrow, uh, Nassauer at the University of Michigan uh, for some pointers about uh, Professor Lee. Uh, Professor Nassauer is, as many of you may know, one of the most accomplished landscape architects in the nation. And she wrote this, it's difficult to talk about Professor Lee without speaking solely in superlatives, but that is inevitable because of her intelligence, creative energy, and collaborative spirit are such a rare and powerful combination. On a more personal note, she is a resolute and independent seeker of wild nature. So without further ado, welcome, Professor Lee. Oh, thank you. Oh, I don't expect that. That's such a great, uh, nice compliment. And for those you are online, uh, just for your information, I'm going to turn off the uh, video since you are looking at a PowerPoint and it's a, at a weird angle. So, um, and so, yeah. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today and to give a uh, series of the UCP research uh, seminar. So, so, uh, oh yeah, someone, yeah, for um, some, could, could, could you all, uh, the participants on over Zoom, um, uh, mute yourself, please. Uh, we are hearing some random talking here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, there are three major lines of my research interest. The first one is uh, thinking about nature-based solutions and their use for risk reduction related to climate hazards. The second one is the challenge of um, green gentrification issues that basically results uh, like people get displaced because of investment in uh, green infrastructure that are aiming at uh, resilience. And the third line is a general um, interest in landscape experience and ecological design. For example, how green space can benefit people's well-being. Uh, in today's very limited time, I will focus on the very first one Uh, so we are witnessing many unprecedented events all the time uh, recently, from flooding to extreme heat to droughts and wildfires. Um, on the one hand, it has to do with the changing climate, but on the other hand, it also has to do how the landscapes has been changed uh, in the urbanizing process. Uh, for example, we all know as we're transforming vegetative land covers into impervious areas, we get uh, stronger uh, urban heat island effects. It generates more stormwater and much more faster. So uh, I would argue that an essential adaptation to climate change has to do with how we manage and design our landscapes. So there has been tremendous attention um, from policy and also practice on this idea called nature-based solutions. This is just one of those new umbrella terms. You can think of it as a more broader um, set of interventions, including green infrastructure we may be more familiar with. But in general, there are actions that are uh, inspired by, supported by, or copied from nature. For example, the World Bank Group has um, work together with a group of partners, including designers, uh, to develop this catalog of uh, summarizing some nature-based solutions that you can use at 
um, the city scale, such as green corridors, the uh, river floodplains, and um, construction constructed wetlands, as well as the at the neighborhood and building scale. So we are looking at more uh, smaller in uh, smaller interventions, such as green roofs and green uh, walls and bioretention areas. The research focus on nature-based solutions in urban context is also rapidly growing. So in, to me, the uh, MBS uh, idea is interesting because it, it's not only concerned about uh, how we preserve existing uh, ecosystems or restore them, but also the potential to integrate technological and engineered systems with natural systems to deliver uh, services we are in urgent need, such as mitigating flooding and uh, extreme heat. Such hybrid interventions are especially relevant in urban contexts where lands are often minimal and the uh, urban, uh, the natural system has been disrupted to some degree and often require uh, human intervention and maintain, maintenance. So I will, I use novel um, MBS to differentiate such practices from those focusing more on ecological conservation and restoration. So while working out the technological aspects of MBS is apparently essential, one aspect I would argue that has not been paid so much attention of to is how people are going to perceive such practice. Because MBS are often uh, visible and accessible to the public, which means they are relevant to our daily life and also they are an object of public opinion. Further, experience of uh, major-based solutions can also influence people's well-being and quality of life, as well as their support for um, adoption of such practice. So it's therefore important to understand how people perceive MBS and what shapes their perceptions. But before we jump into these um, questions, I want to emphasize the everyday landscape context where MBS are envisioned. To the extent that we are aiming to pervasively um, adopt MBS in the landscape to uh, address climate change impacts, MBS are not limited to uh, remote wilderness, nature reserves, or iconic uh, projects, but will be a part of our everyday landscape surroundings, such as the city streets, uh, the neighborhood, uh, oh, green space, or residential yards. While such everyday landscape may look quite um, ordinary, they are actually important for people's well-being and uh, quality of life. For example, there's a large body of evidence showing the um, long-term and short-term benefits for uh, physical, psychological, and social well-being uh, related to green space. And after COVID, we we'll probably all have some uh, more appreciation of nearby nature that we can easily access to just take a break, breath and relax. Also, as human beings, we demand some essential qualities from our surrounding environment, such as safety, order, um, familiarity, and stability. We have expectations for how a human dominated landscape should look like, which are not always align with the environmental goals. Um, I found these two signs, uh, signages pretty re revealing um, in terms of how we respond to a landscape in our uh, everyday life. So on the left, you see um, this, there, this is a constructed wetland, but apparently um, some environmental, environmental education is needed uh, in place here in a hope that it can um, cultivate a more positive perception towards this highly functioning landscape, rather than having people look at it as a deserted landscape that is messy and um, unsafe and unattractive. And on the right, you have this, people apparently have no trouble understanding why you apply uh, chemical poisonous stuff 
they just need um, to, to keep the long uh, grain and meat. They just need a notification that they will need, they will have to stay away uh, from it for a while. So I, I think this kind of shows us like environmental benefits do not automatically ensure pleasant experience. Um, rather, what is immediately perceivable in, in a landscape can el elicit very rapid and intuitive feelings of good and bad or pleasant or unpleasant. Further, in the management of everyday landscape, people can prioritize pleasant experience over environmental benefits, which are often not uh, easily noticed or take time to uh, deliver. So as we consider public perceptions of novel MBS, we need to pay attention to how they, they change the landscape in a noticeable way um, and how people will respond to such change. With these ideas as a conceptual basis, next I want to walk you through two studies um, I have led on MBS for urban storm water management. Uh, urban, flood, uh, urban plural flooding happens when stormwater runoff overwhelms the stormwater infrastructure. Um, there is an increasing risk of plural flooding due to more extreme storm events, aging infrastructure, and growing impervious surfaces in a city. The key challenge to address this uh, issue is to make more space for stormwater while also ensuring the um, daily use of urban spaces. And MBS practices such as detention and retention areas, um, bioretention gardens, have promised to manage some water while also deliver other uh, social and environmental benefits. At the same time, during the process of manager, managing storm water, MBS can um, in, introduce a change of water level um, and that may affect nearby residents' experience. So these two studies have a, a slightly different focus. In the first one, I investigated how landscape design elements may um, relate to people's perception. And in the second study, I focused more on the human dimensions, you know, how experience of past uh, flooding events and other individual characteristics may affect people's perception. So both two studies are uh, based on data collected from a mail survey in three US cities, where we surveyed residents coming from different areas with high versus low income and high versus low uh, flood hazards. In total, about uh, nearly a thousand respondents uh, returned their, uh, the, the questionnaire. So for the survey itself, I wanna point out a key um, aspect of it is that we used uh, this kind of highly realistic visualizations they are not real pictures, but they are photos, uh, you know, showing the different water levels um, of MBS practice. And we ask about how people perceive um, this practice as a way to manage storm water in their cities. And the questionnaire also include other questions uh, relating some flooding experience, flooding issues and um, social demographic status. So the first study focused on uh, what we call smart ponds, which are retention ponds that are managed by smart systems. So the innovation of this system is it can control the flow of water entering the pond or out of, coming out of the pond based on real-time uh, weather data, as well as the monitoring of a series of ponds uh, in a location. And, and also what your goal uh, for uh, managing the quantity and quality of stormwater. It's a, it's a developing, evolving uh, system. Um, but what I'm interested here is with this kind of active 
um, management of storage. For example, you can drain the pond before a big storm hits to uh, create more space for some water. Or you can keep the water at a higher level um, than the naturally it would be um, to, uh, after a storm to hold more water. But at the same time, the stormwater ponds, uh, retention ponds are serving as an amenity, a very valued amenity in many communities. So the question I have here, you know, is the smart systems is controlling the water level and there are other design elements present in, the, in this landscape, such as the, uh, what plants are growing around it, uh, what land use context the pond is located in and the basin slope. So um, in a study, I looked at, uh, asked three questions, you know, how water level relate to people's perception and how other design elements relate to perception. And more importantly, um, are the effects of water level um, moderated or like depending on the, the other design elements? And I looked, based on the literature, I looked at three types of perception here, perceived attractiveness, perceived neatness, and perceived safety. So there are three key um, findings from this study. The first one is, so the water level changes by smart systems can undermine the amenity experience pounds offer to nearby residents. So this is a quick uh, descriptive uh, graph just to give you an idea of how um, on average people's perception shifts uh, with the water level. As you can tell, so the three, the uh, balance rates, the neutral, where you know you perceive some the, the practice that's neither attractive or unattractive, neither safe or dangerous, et cetera. So you can see for a typical water level, um, it's always uh, in a positive realm. But as the water levels start to change, you see um, the perception entering the like, more negative realm. And the interesting thing is for safety and attractiveness and neatness, it's, it's a little bit different um, between the low versus high water level. So for the low water level, people are more concerned about the uh, attractiveness and neatness, like how it looks. Um, but for the high water level, it's more about um, safety uh, concerns. <clears throat> However, the this negative effects of water level changes can be more moderated by some design elements. Um, we, we talked about, for example, so this is um, the contrast between a shallow basin versus a steep basin. So we are looking at a, a basin slope here. And as you can see, while these two practices under the typical water level, they are very similar, like no uh, big difference. But for both low and high water level, the steep uh, basin shape basically was associated with a more positive perception for all the three uh, dimensions. And uh, the third uh, finding is that um, with this changing of water level, the effect of design elements on perception can be different when they are in a typical retention pond. Um, uh, in the literature, there's abandoned evidence of how people have a higher preference of neat looking retention ponds, uh, like this one with a long edge, uh, rather than a more like unmaintained version where you just let the plants grow spontaneously. But what we're seeing here is uh, with the high water level, uh, with the low water level, for example, it's actually the unmaintained uh, scenario was perceived as more positive than the uh, long term scenario. So, a speculation I have is you know, with, with the water level being dropped down, people may see there's like some uh, malfunction issue or it looks messy, but that goes well with the unmaintained plants. But the, since the long term looks very well maintained, it kind of 
create these very contrasting feelings uh, that people may find confusing, like what's happening here. Um, so now we'll move to the second study where I focus more on the um, human dimension. And especially I looked at perceived safety here because from one observation from the first the previous study, although it's not the key research question, is that I found perceived safety was less explained by design elements. So it may be more related to some human uh, factors. So that's why I'm focusing more on uh, the safety issue in this study. And in this study, I looked at another um, novel MBS practice, uh, which I call floodable sites. But this idea has been around, especially in practice, uh, design practice, but also increasingly uh, planners and engineers are looking at a possibility to use more um, diverse urban space such as recreation sites, plazas, or minor streets to accommodate different wet and dry weather functions. So when there's no storm, you just use the space as you really use it. But when the storm hits, it can become this temporary um, air, um, area to hold water or convey water. Um, so that's something you know we are trying to explore um, if that's a way we can go since we, we really try to find more space for water uh, when big storm hits. And there are some built examples here. This is a pretty like several years from now, almost like 10 years, but this is a newer project um, in Denmark. You can see from the visualization side. It's a pretty a lot of water that are imagined to be hold there. Uh, so well, this kind of practice has the promise, you know, to increase the capacity when managed stormwater. One thing that has not been looked at empirically is how people perceive them, especially in terms of their safety. There are anecdotes like residents calling. Um, plaza design like this as drowning plaza, um, but you know there's no research has been done to uh, examine this. And in this study, I draw on this concept called risk as feelings from uh, cognitive psychology to to use it as a framework to think about how people are going to perceive um, the stormwater changes in floodable sites. Uh, what this concept suggests is that when faced with uncertainty or risky situations, people tend to make quick and intuitive judgments uh, rather than analyzing the probability of an outcome and its uh, consequences. Such perception of risk involves effective processing, the feeling of something uh, as good or, ba or bad. And through lived experience and learning, we may associate certain uh, image, sound, smell, or words with um, positive and negative feelings. So since storm, storm infrastructure has long been designed to remove um, storm water quickly from built area to prevent puddling and pooling of water, um, people may feel unsafe and, or that something has go, gone, gone wrong when they are seeing inundated uh, urban spaces like the one uh, in floodable sites. And this might be uh, especially the case for people who have uh, more experience with localized flooding. So that kind of leads to uh, the questions I try to address here. Um, the first question is I ask is how safe floodable sites are perceived? Um, and I, in particular, to put that in perspective, I compare it with the retention ponds, which is it typically always uh, typically high pass water. Um, and the second question I ask is, do people's perceived safety of MBS um, depend or relate to their experience of localized flooding? And the third question is looking at what other contextual or 
uh, social demographic factors. You know, for the contextual um, here, I'm looking at factors such as um, their knowledge of stormwater um, and their participation in stormwater management and um, general environmental sustainability issues. And social demographic factors are looked at such uh, factors such as um, age, gender, race, um, etc. So, um, the regarding the first question, um, what we see is for both practice under the storm conditions, perceived safety is lower than the man storm conditions. So that's kind of what it is expected. But the interesting thing is, if you look at variable size of uh, uh, retention ponds, the ponds are actually perceived as safer um, under the storm conditions. So the number here, the main number of the difference is pretty small, but it's given the large sample we have, it's uh, still a significant, statistically significant um, difference. And the second result is that uh, more experience of localized flooding, which I operate operationalized by how often people noticed uh, standing water or flooding near their home were associated, was associated with lower perceived safety of floodable sites. But uh, I didn't see um, strong association be between this experience and retention ponds. Reflecting this result through the risk as feelings framework, people may perceive uh, inundated floodable sites as unsafe because it looks like um, flooded area. Um, and they may perceive the high water level ponds as more safe um, because it's a like more natural looking and familiar practice where you know the water level fluctuations may be more expected. And regarding the third re research questions, um, females perceived both practice as less safe. Um, I don't have a uh, a good answer to that, like why we are seeing this. But some potential reasons we can think about is that first, um, males are have been reported to express fear or worry less. They don't really show that. Uh, and the second factor I want to point to is uh, females, in many cases, um, are the primary caretaker of children and home, so they may be more concerned of these potential risks. And looking at this too, you can also see besides gender, uh, no other social demographic factors I examined seem to associate with uh, safe, perceived safety of vulnerable sites, but there are other age, race, and having children in their household are associated. Uh, so it may be the uh, pounds is a more uh, familiar practice. It has been used for a long time. And for this one, people who have children in their household, um, they tend to perceive the pound as less safe. This is uh, supports some evidence uh, from previous studies that reported safety concerns about drowning hazards um, in pounds. And for race and age, um, so race here is the people who are non-white, uh, including Black, Latino, Asian, or Native American, tend to perceive ponds as less safe than a uh, retention pond, uh, less safe than their white counterpart. So one reason I can think of to explain that is people, um, now why people may have less access to green space that have retention ponds. And so they may, or they may have access to ponds that are not so well maintained. And so in general, they don't have a very positive experience of such practice. And when the water level is high, they tend to see it as a malfunction or things has gone wrong. Uh, and another factor is age. So older people tend to perceive it as more safe, uh, which may have to do, they have like more uh, nature experience and they can 
they're more tolerant to some uh, dynamics and changes in the um, natural world. And so that kind of point to some potential uh, different reasons uh, behind the person's safety of this to practice. But of course, more research um, is needed on that. And especially explaining uh, qualitative research that can help explain like why certain people have um, certain uh, perceptions. So I think looking at these two studies together, uh, a general implication is that we must consider landscape experience when developing NBS. The environmental functions and benefits of NBS may not be evident to community members. Rather, noticeable landscape characteristic draw people's attention and may not be intuitively perceived as desirable or um, positive in the context of everyday life. So to address this issue, um, we need to look from the first study, um, the results we have focused on and explore um, planning, management, and design choices that may help el elicit more positive perception. And from the second study, what we can learn is that we should also account for um, the different social demographic as well as experience with um, climate events, extreme climate events, when we are working with a specific community. And further, uh, what I haven't got a chance to look at is more uh, the, the importance of a strong or clear communication of the functionality of this practice uh, to community members so they can connect to what is happening in a landscape um, they can see with uh, goals and uh, functions for climate change adaptation and resilience. So there are many stories. Uh, I don't know if you heard of this uh, story uh, where people have been fighting against the wind power, uh, the offshore wind turbines for many, many years and the project um, ended up just finally terminating and never got built. Um, but I think this is our, among many stories that can, sh can suggest the strong emotions uh, related to our landscape experience and their power to accelerate, or in this case, hinder positive change. Humans are not optimized algorithms and I would argue that to shift uh, human behavior toward the landscape on a larger scale, it will benefit um, from a deeper understanding of how, uh, of what jobs people's immediate attention and what ties to people, um, people's effective responses. I will end my talk here, um, but before we go to the Q&A, I have a quick advertisement. Um, we don't have many students here uh, showing up, but since you are here, I would assume you are have some slight interest in this topic. And I'm looking for um, master students, also undergraduates maybe to work with me on projects uh, like this and more. If you are interested, um, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm also trying to recruit a PhD student starting next fall, uh, four years fully funded. So if you are interested in doing some serious research, um, you can also uh, reach out to me. And so um, I will, that's my talk for today. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I'd love to hear your questions, thoughts, comments, ideas. Thank you.